can you hear me? So before I start talking, I would like to thank uh, Marketa and the team of, uh, of the festival for inviting me to this panel and to Prague. Thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about photography and now, uh, which in a way uh, starts the whole uh, panel discussion. Um, so in my sp in my speech, uh, I will start my speech. In what way does photography, whose surface seems to reflect everyday reality, open up into other more illusory worlds? In this lecture, we shall consider two assumptions referred to in the topic of this panel discussion. And the assumptions are as follows. First, that photography does indeed reflect everyday reality. And second, that every, everyday reality is not as illusory as other worlds. Verification of these assumptions may prove crucial for providing an answer to the main question of the panel. We begin with the second assumption, emphasizing that photography, thanks to its references to reality, participates in the current debate about what reality is. Nowadays, the status of reality is uncertain, as is the distinction between the real and the illusory. Photography itself has contributed to the state of affairs. Remaining within the analysis of the second assumption, we now turn our attention to the phenomenon of time, in which the problematic nature of everyday reality is cle clearly revealed. Saint Augustine commented on this problem, stating that he understood what time was when nobody asked him about it, but could not give an answer when asked. Since Saint Augustine, the paradoxical nature of time has lost nothing of its problematic character. The relationship of photography to time fits into its paradoxical nature. This can be described as follows. Because the past no longer <clears throat> exists and the future does not exist yet, there is only now. The now, however, is not perceptible, as it eludes us in a leap from not yet to no more. Photography is an attempt to capture the now in its sleep, which, as many thinkers have emphasized, is only possible at the cost of killing the now. Sorry. Mm. Mm. Therefore, here one could ask, what is the relationship of photography to time, to the past, and to memory as the primary form of the past's existence? A photographic image, in juxtaposition to memory and the perception of the ever elusive now, stands on the threshold of what is illusory. The past as a memory is alive in the sense that it keeps transforming itself and assuming new shapes, never quite reaching a solid state. This is even more so in the case of our perception of reality in all its aspects. What we perceive, perceive is fluid and changeable and constantly eludes us. A photographic image contravenes this amorphousness. Net. Amorphousness? even though a photograph is not always definite in every respect. What is here an illusion and what is real? A photographic image or perception and memory. Let us now consider some examples. Andrzej Janczewski is a, is a young Polish uh, artist who graduated from Poznan University of Arts. And in his project, <laughs> Uh, I, I translated this as, as developing images from memory because this is a language uh, game in Polish. Uh, and in this project, he asked for people who know him very well to allow to create a photo fit uh, of himself in cooperation with a uh, photo fit specialist. Photo fit means uh, building up an accurate image of the person to fit their description of the witness when crime is committed. And these are the results. So this one was created by the artist's niece, his girlfriend, his mother, his friend, and he himself. And this is what he looks like. <laughs> 
and some and this is what how he presented the the the, the project. <laughs> The next artist I'm going to show the work of is Zygmunt Rydka, and this is a very well-known Polish uh, photographer uh, who uh, for quite a long time has been creating a series called Momentary Objects. The paradox or perhaps the illusion of time in our perception and in a photographic image is explored in Rydka's works from the Momentary Object series. You can just look. So here uh, in the first slides, you can see the way he works. Of, uh, the work of Zygmunt Rydka is situated somewhere between a permanent search for a definition of the structure of a work of art and the passing of biological time, marked by the awareness of the fact. The artist traces the shifting shadow cast onto the wall by the subject of the photograph in an attempt to transfer our elusive now into the timeless multiplied present of a photographic image. A puzzle unfolds before, before our eyes only to remain, uh, remain unsolved as always. An unexpected solution is offered <coughs> by experiments in extra long exposures associated with the name uh, of the German photographer Michael Vasseli and by the solar graphics technique widely propagated by the Polish artists Sławomir Decyk and Paweł Kula and by Diego Lopez Calvin from Madrid. The photographic technique uh, was invented by those three uh, artists, which are, out of whom two are Polish and one is Spanish. Uh, the project Solar Graphics actually uh, was initiated, uh, was inspired by the project Solaris, in which they recorded the uh, continuous, <clears throat> they recorded the, the way the sun, the sun way, sun, the way the sun uh, moves in, uh, in the sky. <clears throat> Solar graphics re uh, record the traje trajectories of the sun's movement across the sky in different parts of the world, wherever there are enthusiasts of the technique. The movements are registered by means of cameras without lenses, and light-sensitive material is exposed in such a way that the image is revealed directly without the use of further chemical processes. This method allows for extremely long exposure times, as long as six months up to one year. Using the technique, Detsik, Kula and Calvin have carried out their joint project called Solaris. This is what Pavel Kula writes about it. What, could, what would we see if our perceptual apparatus ran slower? If our film speed would require, would require a week, a month, or a year to register an image. The shoe black and his client, accidentally captured by Daguerre, are standing on the Paris Boulevard, surrounded by a crowd of indistinguishable figures, blurred due to many minutes of exposure. If a blink of an eye lasts a month, the Earth's surface begins to pulsate. People dissolve in the fog of vibrating beings. The day emerges with the night and the sky is traversed by the shimmering arc of the wandering sun. Perhaps this is how stones see the world. This is by uh, the first Polish artist, uh, Decyk. And you can see the um, length of the exposure. Pull out. 
for the second Polish artist. And Diego Lopez, the Spanish one. Each day the sun rises and sets at a different point on the horizon. The motionless camera obscura record this process as a unique hieroglyph. Depending on the design and the location of the device, one can record overlapping cycles, weather changes, wind force, the movement of the Earth along its heliocentric orbit. The sun is an aperture through which flows the brightest light. One can try to photograph things that are difficult to imagine. Michael Vasily uh, employs even longer exposure times. Using large format cameras, 4x5, he captures the light from his objects up to three years in monochrome or, or color. He has been inventing and refining techniques for using extremely long camera exposures since the early 1990s. Through the use of filters and very small aperture, yet one that is standard in the professional camera lens, he is able to diminish the amount of light hitting the negative to the point where he can extend the exposure many thousands of, thousands of times longer than you would expect. <clears throat> Michael wanted to highlight that he also sees those lines as an indicator for something else. This is what he says. The lines in the sky put our existence, us, our planet, into context with the dance of the universe, which coexists on an entirely different time scale from us. With up to two year long exposures, he documented the construction being done at Potsdamer Platz in Berlin between 1997 and 1999. The project was commissioned by Daimer Kreitzer. The images taken from five different camera positions <coughs> and transformed the chronological sequences of the construction activity into one simultaneous action. next pr uh, project that I'm going to show is um, called Open Shutter and this is where he photographed the Museum of Modern Art. The capturing of the reconstruction of the Museum of Modern Art in New York lasted uninterruptedly for 34 months and required eight custom-made cameras in four different corners. After three years the images were complete and their pentimental like strata of transparencies and overlays rendered the construction project's evolution in time as a dense and delicate network of forms and colors in space. And at this point, the history of photography has paradoxically come a full circle, returning in a sense to its very origins, when it had to contend with long exposure, <coughs> exposures by necessity. In the resulting photographs, the bustling streets of Paris looked quite deserted. Already then, it became clear that the registration method has a significant impact on the image of the world that is being registered. It can either call into being or push out of existence various phenomena, like a sieve that captures some particles of reality while irretrievably losing others. Nowadays, <clears throat> nowadays, it is by conscious choice rather than due to technological limitations that we can look at what we refer to as transients in a way different from everyday perception. These attempts at capturing the elusive time resemble ghost hunting and like spiritualist photos taken a hundred or more years ago, they create a startling visual effect. A ghost appears in the picture. This time we do not have to look out for many devious tricks like the Master Houdini did, did back then. Rather, photography exposes tricks played out by our perception of reality <clears throat> and challenges our understanding of what is real and what is illusory. The works in question reveal to us a look at reality, sub specie eternitatis, of which Plato and St. Augustine dreamed. For them, only the immutable is truly real. 
Ever since ancient Greece, cognition has been identified with the sense of sight. In other words, what we can see is real. Experiments perform performed by De Vesely, Detsip, Kula, and Calvin push the limits of the concept by switching illusion and reality around. The time and space structure, <coughs> fundamental to how we perceive the world, has undergone a far-reaching transformation in photography that employs extra-long exposure, which undoubtedly re relativizes our sensing of reality and illusion. In this context, one can hardly avoid associations with the model of spatial-temporal spatial structure of reality adopted in physics since Einstein. The integration of the temporal dimension into the three-dimensional space of classical physics could not be illustrated better than in the images we are discussing here. Irrespective of all this, one has to admit that these experiments result in images that strongly appeal to imagination and have a great symbolic and rhetor rhetorical potential. This leads us directly to the second question posed at the beginning of this discussion, namely, <clears throat> to what extent does photography actually refract everyday reality? Ever since the invention of photography, the issue of its referentiality has been a subject of intense debate, and so far no definite answer have, have been, answers have been given. As we know, Baudrillard announced the death of all references also in the medium of photography. Even if we decide that this declaration is premature and that the referentiality of photography remains unchallenged, the reference does not necessarily relate to what we call everyday reality. Photography is suspended between <clears throat> the real reference and the ideal reference, between a concrete object that we could point at and designate using a proper name and a culturally conditioned meaning, an ideal object that is inevitably involved in any, even the most mundane perception. Therefore, we always see a lot more than we actually see. <laughs> the surplus of meaning turns the photographic image into a sensory hallucination that not so much replaces the faithful reflection of reality as coexists with it. Of course, faithful reflection of reality is not without problems of its own. In his essay titled Walker, Walker Evans' America, a Documentary Invention, Alan Trachtenberg states, by contrast and differentiation, the opening pictures insist that the camera is an instrument of construction, not mere transcription that it plays a role in the making of the world it depicts as image. Significantly, the remarks were made in the context of works that are usually considered the paradigm of documentary photography. This would mean that a certain admixture of illusion belongs to the very nature of the photographic medium. It turns out that the medium is paradoxical in its functioning. It is suspended between, <coughs> between two poles Following Trachtenberg, we can refer to them as the transcription pole and the construction creation pole. It balances between the two poles, now getting closer to one, now to the other, but never quite reaching either of them. A camera that constructs the world through images leads us straight to the semiotic dimension of photography, to the photography as a sign. <coughs> According to the classical typology of signs developed by Charles Pierce, a sign can be a trace, index, an image, icon, or a symbol. The first class of signs presupposes a direct physical link between the sign and its referent. This imparts especially authenticity and realism to an object, in our case, an object of photography. The pursuit of this authentic immediacy brought about an entire trend in the photography that seeks to bypass the role of the camera and to limit the artist's interference with the final shape of, shape of a photographic work. The trend can be exemplified with the photographs and so-called tactile paintings by Andrzej Pawłowski, who is a late Polish artist, sculptor, and, ar and architect. His work was grounded in the rich European, European tradition of this type of artistic expression. For example, pre-war avant-garde artists like Molinai, photograms or Carol Hiller's heliographs. Babowski became famous for his work based on photographic techniques but pr produced without the use of, of a camera. In the photograms from the Prologomena series, 
<coughs> the chemicals were applied directly to the emulsion. Uh, the photographic pieces that he created were called the tactile paintings, and the term was divided by Jan Szufka, a Polish arts critic. The artist dipped his hands in the developer and then used them to paint on photographic paper in daylight. The next series that used simil a similar technique is hallucinations or traces of gesture. The results were interesting in color effects uh, and these are just the traces of his hands, chest, back. And later on, he uh, also applied ink to the prints. And the, um, the last series I'm going to show is just the traces of his body. And the dedication. going to be faster because uh, I'm talking too much. Uh, anyway, I will quickly show the next artist who is Josef Robakowski and his thermograms because the, the, the work is very interesting. Uh, they are called hot pictures and actually the way he worked was um, he heated objects that he uh, put close to uh, sensitive material. So these are just traces of the object. The, uh, the paper is not fixed, so it also works with time and it changes. And of course, this is uh, this is an, uh, another example of a piece that uh, uh, in, in which an artist uses uh, techniques beyond uh, the control. Just too much. Um, okay, a photograph as a sign, insofar as it is involved in imagery and remains iconic rather than indexing, is even more center, certain to penetrate the human soul and the territory of that which is illusory and unreal. Um, and this is a, another Polish artist from the 60s. Um, in which he associate, he works uh, and creates metaphors, uh, images as metaphors. In his work, the visual aspect is freed from the documentary referentiality, but not from the ideal referentiality, relating to sense and, and meaning. Vardak's metaphorical montage, despite its poetic elusiveness, is deep, deeply immersed in reality. In fact, illusion proves to be the key to what is real. If, as Paul Ricoeur puts it, meaning is what is being said, why reference is the subject of what is being said, then reality, as captured by photography, would find itself at the intersection of meaning and reference, proving to be credible and phantasmagorical at the same time. So that this presentation could be concluded with the following reflection. The ten tendency of the medium of photography to create illusory worlds out of matter that is rooted in physical reality and is by no means illusory follows from the ambivalent nature of the medium itself. As a result, we observe the phenomenon that Bernd Stiegler calls a true hallucination. Can a hallucination be true? And if so, how is such a hallucination different from normal perception? There is no difference. Normal perception is, in fact, and quotation, a true hallucination, an inner dream that remains in agreement with the outside world. From this point of view, a photographic image is at the same time strongly linked with reality and radically separated from it. Perception, or more precisely perceiving, is a waking dream, and the photographer focused on perceiving is fishing for the dream. Thank you very much.